Innovation is something you could point out that raises your share price. That's really, really good. Yeah, I mean. Sorry, when I, once I started seeing the corporate logos for all the corporate labs, and I, I used to work in a corporate lab, and it's very. Yeah, I mean, right now, innovation is this incredibly, you know, hot term, but as some of you who work at innovation centers, were those centers around 10 years ago, 15 years ago, under that name, innovation? And if they were, that's impressive. Because where's not things coming up new and, you know, changing? Should we go back, continue? So in our work, we sort of define innovation as solving problems, coming up with new ideas, creating solutions, and new approaches. And the last two are really sort of the, the bread and butter of what we do, creating new, new approaches and new solutions. So using new approaches to create solutions. But we sort of work in an area called social innovation. And what is social innovation? It can be this very kind of scattered diagram of people and information, empathy and ethos and impact and processes in business, but we define it in a much sort of clearer, clearer cut way. Um, there are new social practices that aim to meet social needs in a better way than existing solutions, resulting from working conditions, education, community development, or health. Ideas are created with the goal of extending and strengthening civil society. So taking the elements, the core of innovation, um, but not necessarily the business side, that's important to note, and using them to um, kind of attack and really examine social problems. So problems don't really get a lot of attention. So things to do with improving our community and our environment, um, you know, sustainability, unemployment, any kind of area you can think about, it's a social area, we can use innovation to kind of come in and help work with that. Um, not necessarily excluding a business strategy, but it can be it is it can be integrated as well, and that's an important thing to note um, as we move forward. So with social innovation, we see a lot of excitement and energy and involvement. Um, there's hackathons, there's makeathons, there's conferences, there's brand hacks, there's workshops, and anything you can imagine to come and sort of solve these brand challenges. And they're incredible, and they're exciting, and they're thought-provoking, and they're inspiring. But we realize there's a really big disparity because what happens the day after? The day after syndrome, we started calling it. And really looking at this thing and saying, you know, we come to these events, we have so many incredible ideas, amazing conversations, interactions, we leave inspired to move ahead and move forward. We're going to work with this guy and that guy and together, and then it kind of just falls apart because the mechanisms aren't in place to, to continue the work <coughs> and see it all the way through to actual impact and real world change. A lot of times because there's no recognized business model or you know, profitability, or there is profitability, but it's not quite as clear or open as, as one would think. So we say you've got to just do it and set it for the next day after, but do it, do it responsibly. So, Social innovation for unmet needs, taking it down one step further. So unmet needs is an area, that's our wheelhouse, that's where we live. Um, we define unmet needs as needs with no mainstream market solution. The market doesn't create or doesn't make solutions for them for a variety of reasons. Um, there's neglected or visible users, there's not perceived market, market share, profitability, it's, it's small. It's smaller than average, they don't see the ROI. The user is often invisible. They don't have a voice. They can't speak out. They don't are not active. Their buying power isn't recognized. And sometimes they think the problem is too small to solve. It's an orphan problem. It won't increase. So it all comes back to the same thing where people aren't really seeing potential or you know profitability to create solutions for these unmet needs. And we don't agree with that. We look at social unmet needs. So areas where we think in our world things should be changing, things should be innovating. There are better ways to do things. Um, the most relevant example here would be the walker on the top right. Everyone's kind of seen people putting tennis balls in the bottom of their walkers to help them glide smoother. And it's gotten to the point where it's become so ubiquitous that they're now selling walker, they're called walker like glide bases, and they look like tennis balls. They're neon green, they're, it's really crazy, but in my mind, that picture to me is everything because we live in the United States, we live in Israel, we live in the most developed modern countries in the world, and that is the solution still, the widely accepted solution. And it really shouldn't be the case. 
because innovation comes to lots of different areas, but not always the ones that need it most. Looking at assistive tech, you know, crutches from 1622 to 2017, they look exactly the same. If you look here, you can even see kind of a wrist, a wrist strip, a wrist strap, similar to what's holding up it just elbows on on the Canadian crutches. The crutches haven't changed. And in our world where innovation is happening so rapidly and changing so quickly, we would probably update the slides to include an Apple Watch. There's really no, no excuse for that. And we always come back to this picture because this is why we do what we do. There really is no reason why this should be the case when we are innovating like this. So a very superficial question, was that Idris Elba? Yes. Okay, you just Apparently made my really morning. <laughs> <laughs> he should be the next James Bond, I've just yeah. thrown it out there. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. he handled his sprained ankle like a pro, so <laughs> lots of paparazzi. When I searched, I searched man with crutches, there was like 30 paparazzi pictures of him, so he handled, he handled himself very well apparently with his sprained ankle and gave me a really great visual for my presentation, so I love that shit. Yes, I would. I do So we want to go a little bit more to our work and our approach. So we've both been in the social innovation field for a variety of years, working together and through separate um, initiatives and projects, and we kind of started talking about two years ago and saying, okay, incredible things are happening, there's energy, people want to do it. We've been all over, the, quite literally all over the world, doing social innovation, working with people who want to make a change in their community, people who come to volunteer, students, professionals, parents, everyone wants to come in and do good. But how can we really make a difference and make real impact? Because we kept seeing again and again and again that day after syndrome of energy in the room is exciting, it's palatable, it's electric, but then the next day, how do you move forward? And you all in businesses, I know this is a lot of sort of hardware materials type things um, based here in the Wizard Park. When I quick look at the sheet, you guys understand how long it takes to get something out there, to really get into the market, regulations and testing and materials and iteration after iteration and prototypes. And that can't happen in a three day hackathon or a one day conference or even a course in a semester, as you know. But we try and do what we can to ensure that we can really move forward. So, we developed a really kind of unique methodology that lets us work from the very beginning with a focus on the end. So every step of the way, we're thinking about how do we make the impact, how do we focus this more, how do we hone in more to get to where we want to go. So we start by identifying needs. We work with different partners to identify unmet social needs in each community. We embrace research as informing the problem, not just as the, the feedback on a proposed solution. So our work, our, our approach can kind of work with any sort of unmet need. Right now, our focus is on people with disabilities, aging populations, but we have done work in environmental things, sustainability, neonatal, <coughs> any sort of background you can think of. When we say identify the needs, we are working with, with the users all the time. So we want to understand who they are, what do they need, what are their thoughts. The user knows everything the user and their surroundings. We call them need knowers. The need knower is someone who lives with the need themselves or who has a personal, professional understanding of the need. They have all the information. They're the golden, they're the golden ticket as far as we're concerned because they know what they really, really need. And research is incredibly important because a lot of times it's been done. And we've done things in the past, we've created these solutions, we've spent all this time and made really incredible things, and the next day, someone sent us a link from Amazon and said, oh look, isn't this what you guys just did yesterday? Available for $2 and click of a button? <coughs> so research is important to understand what's out there. Research is important to understand, is there a market? Are there people? Who will use this? Who are the users? Who are the, you know, kind of auxiliary users? How can we move forward? Getting back by that, which is really kind of a new, you know, concept. For me, at least, I came from a nonprofit background originally, and the whole idea of bringing in data and numbers and quantitative ways to back up what we're doing is really important to our current model. So we connect to the need knowers. We work with them, work with their organizations. And the organizations are also really kind of strong, strong link because the user, is, the need knower, is an expert in his or her own world and own case. 
but the organization has more of a global knowledge. So if I talk to a rehabilitation scientist from an insert name of big hospital here, I'm, and they tell me that there's a need, I know that they not only are familiar with their community, their hospital, their patients, but they're members of international consortia, they go to conferences, they meet people. If they tell me there's a need, I know that they have looked far and wide and have not found something. So they have a really sort of over, more of a broad look at how needs and how money are out there. NGO, public sector, academia, universities are huge incredible source of professional being there. People are literally sitting here doing research all day long. So they, you know, we're in a research park. They know we work with them to understand better. And then we do social innovation. We kind of bring all these different worlds together. We bring together technologists, designers, engineers, programmers, therapists, farmers, anyone who has a share who can come in and give their skills, give their expertise, and we bring them together to kind of create early stage solutions to, to different challenges using a universal inclusive design methodologies. So we really believe in the multidisciplinary connections and the breaking down of silos and in getting people from different backgrounds and different expertise to work together. Because when you have five experts sitting around the table who all speak differently and who all have different ways of thinking, and bring them together around a table, on the one hand, it can be incredibly stressful and incredibly, you know, cause some friction, but also creates real magic. And, you know, the first time you ever see an engineer and a social worker sitting together and working on the same problem, it's really fascinating because they think so differently, but they all have really strong expertise to bring to the table and kind of make it happen. So we work with them, we bring the user in, we create really kind of early stage ideas. And this is normally where the work would end, pictures would be taken, and the bathroom syndrome would begin. But we are taking it a step further. We're looking at sustainable incomes. We go back and examine the research that we did at the beginning, and we do it again. We look at the prototypes and the early conclusions that have emerged. We put them through market research. We try and understand, you know, okay, this was developed. Is there potential here? Can it become a full product? Where could this go? Should this stay in an academic environment? Should this go into professional product development? Is this a government policy? What is the outcome? And what are its next steps to kind of taking it forward and creating sort of real sustainable um, change and impact? So just going back to our methodology, these are probably three of our core, <coughs> our core values and what drives all that we're doing. So these are at the center, working directly with the users and their institutions, communities, hospitals, and sharing real needs are best. Nothing about us without us. We're not creating for somebody, we're creating with somebody. And that's a really big sort of crucial difference. Uh, breaking the silos, bringing multidisciplinary teams together, cutting across boundaries. <clears throat> you want the School of Engineering to work with the School of Art, to work with the School of Social Work, to work with the Library, to work with the School of Education. Come together, get them around the table to encourage creativity and lead to sort of really incredible outcomes. Prototyping, <clears throat> using the tools to come up with real prototypes, which are then able to be tested, researched, and moved forward. And we have a whole system set up to bring whatever we need to bring to our users to create real impact. So the deliverables can be anything from a physical prototype, which we could then test, put into product development through our partners, and get them to full market rate potential. The, out the, product, the outcome could be a policy, and we then work with different sort of public sector entities to see about how we can implement those policies where they're relevant. It can be educational curricula. How do we work with students to change their approaches, shift their thinking, shift their mindsets, put into the classroom? It can be a whole host of, of things. So we do our work in kind of several areas. We do make it bonds and hackathons, but we don't do them as standalone events. We do them as part of a longer process. We see that the hackathon as a tool for social change, but not as an all-encompassing element. Because, back again to the day after syndrome, that's the biggest thing. That's always in the back of our mind, that's always when we think about moving forward. We do workshops with companies, with universities, prototyping, teaching people you know, new design skills, new design thinking skills. We work with <coughs> and create actual solutions. We get people in the classroom. We ran a course um, 
at the Cornell Tech, which is the Cornell, the new Cornell campus on Roosevelt Island in New York. We worked with master students there, teaching them different digital fabrication skills, and we matched them. They, we, they worked with residents of a senior center on the island, and not only were they kind of creating solutions for the seniors, the seniors were in the room with them, learning the technologies, understanding, being part of the process, working together. And these are two very different institutions that share a tiny island in the middle of New York City, and working together for the first time, understanding each other, bringing these different worlds together. We do courses with universities. We work with existing courses, like we're doing right here at Illinois, working with Dina and Vishal on their effective courses, helping their students, advising them, helping them you know, think towards sustainability, towards impact, towards unmet needs, really honing in and getting students to work differently and think differently, and work across, <coughs> across silos. Universities are a really, really classic example where our work has made a big impact and is going to continue to make an impact because universities are incredibly siloed. You know, if you are, I remember back in my university days, I studied political science, I had no idea what was happening in engineering, or in design, or in art, or even in, you know, in the humanities, and that was right next door. You're in your own world, you have a major, you have your classes, you don't really understand what's happening. And professors also, for this day, kind of in their own lane, and now the world is changing, we do more multidisciplinary, bring people together, to work together. We teach different design, design thinking skills. We believe that having access, did you want to ask you a question? No, no, I'm sorry. Oh. <coughs> we believe that having access to these kinds of new skills and training sets people up for the future. So back to those seniors, you know, working with them to give them these skills opens up a whole new world to them. Working with people with disabilities, teaching these kind of skills, not only sets them up professionally, gives them access, you know, gives them the opportunity to find employment, but it's gainful employment. It's employment with potential for growth and potential for, you know, redevelopment. It's new sort of 21st century tools, to use a term that's kind of been, you know, used, thrown around a lot, but giving people access to these tools, teaching them the tools of the future. And we do a lot of work with companies as well. We do a lot of, we have new approaches to how do we take sort of CSR, corporate social responsibility, engage users more, engage employees in the work, have them work with their community, but in a way that's meaningful and impactful for the company and for the community. I had a conversation with um, the guy who runs Siemens Robotics in Israel a few um, months ago. And he was talking to me how they had a good deeds day. He said, yeah, we had a good deeds day, and we took you know, our guys to this school, an underprivileged neighborhood. They painted a wall, and then we went pack lunches at a soup kitchen, and it was a really great day. And I looked at him and I said, I'm not at all trying to belittle what you did, but are you telling me that you took 20 highly skilled robotics engineers to paint a wall? You couldn't find something more, more impactful? I said, I could have set you up with a children's rehabilitation center, and you guys could have been hacking wheelchairs all day, it would have been more fun for your guys, and it would have been created much more impact than that school, which, with all due respect, gets this wall painted five times a year during Good Deeds Day. <laughs> really, they did a whole like 2020 article on this one school got its wall painted five times in the course of the year. And the corporations get the same kind of check mark that they're looking for from their CSR, which is their employees in branded t-shirts doing good. We want to engage employees, have them use their skills, give back. The people who are working day in and day out with these, high, high, these highly skilled jobs, they've got three engineering degrees and a doctorate, and they haven't had a chance to use their skills creatively since they were in college. So people love it. And they want to engage and they want to be involved. And it's a really new approach because corporations also are set up in a way that they can help move forward to sustainability. They have the areas set up, they have the processes set up to be able to do kind of real impact. So I could go on with stories for hours and hours, um, but this is just kind of a quote that really sums up what we do, looking at, you know, when we were ourselves traditional thinking, traditional processes, open our minds, we can all create the future. And that's something that really kind of drives us and our work and <laughs> enables us to move forward. We're looking at new approaches and new ways to kind of hack not half, but how to really kind of, you know, work old problems and solve them in new ways. So that's us in a very big nutshell. And I thought we could just have a couple conversations and if anyone any questions. Yeah. So, so I
So I mean, everything you covered, I, and this is maybe a bit direct, but everything you've covered seems sort of, I've seen a cookbook, I've seen this cookbook before, and yeah. a lot of people preach the same cookbook. What makes, what do you, what's the, the secret sauce. sauce, the sauce that makes it sustainable and impactful beyond the next day? I mean, even if I take those, take that example you give me of a seat of Siemens engineers hacking wheelchairs. Okay, so they've hacked wheelchairs for six kids. Okay, so then you know the next year they'll hack six more, and you know there's how many thousands of kids in wheelchairs need their wheelchair hacked. Yeah. How, how does that? What's the? What is your view that to take that and turn it into what's going to happen the day after tomorrow? Yeah. First of all, where's the love direct question? So the more direct, the better. He lived in Israel. Just <laughs> <throw it> <laughs> I think I think the most important thing is to understand what is that you're trying to solve to start with. A lot of people are running to come up with solutions to all sort of problems. We think are the most important thing in the world. Or people come up with all sort of technology to think, okay, this is going to change the world. We are coming with another approach. We are looking at research. We are reaching out to the people. We are trying to scan the market, the potential market. So I will not come to you and say, hey, let's do this before I have a concrete. Um, let's say mission statement, and I will back it up with a concrete research, a very thorough research of what is that we're trying to solve. So if I'm coming with a very precise challenge to a room full with innovators and tell them, okay, this is our mission, we need to solve this, and at the end of the session I will have five different approaches how to solve this problem, I'm a winner. I can choose each one of these five and then cross it again with market research. And then I can evaluate you know, cost uh, and uh, development uh, cost and uh, you know, how, how effective it will be, etc. So we're trying to shift the whole innovation yeah. ecosystem into something which will be much more narrow, but will touch exactly the, the, the people needs it. I think also, if I could just add a few things, I think that the fact that we've identified that there is an after syndrome, a lot of people are sort of living, you know, in there, up in the, you know, up in the sky, and we're doing this as great things, and people aren't even aware of it, aren't talking about it. So we've identified and moving forward with that. And I think that people give these sort of grand statements. We are going to change the world. We're going to do this. We're going to solve global hunger within a decade. We're not. We're going to set into our act. Of course, so obviously, <laughs> obviously, that's where it's all going to come through, and that's you know, <clears throat> there it is. We're taking the small challenges. We're looking at small simple, concise challenges. We're not going to be, at least not right now, until we're, you know, much better funded and huge, we're not creating sort of huge, you know, nanotech crazy solutions that are going to come in on everything. We're looking at sort of small, simple, elegant solutions that make a big difference. So going back to the side, the side with the crutches, just as a small, simple example. If you use crutches to get around your daily life and you make a cup of coffee in your kitchen, how would you get the cup of coffee to the couch? Got an answer for that because I was on crutches over the weekend. <laughs> so what we're working on, we're working on ways for little small attachments, little small things that can make a difference, that can add to that, change that around. Looking at the little, you know, how do you move a pot from the stove to that little small things that can make a difference and can move forward. And we're not promising the moon. Development cycles take time. Development cycles are long and arduous and expensive. And we'll get out there. We also aren't looking to become, you know. We don't want milestone, if it could happen, it'd be great, we wouldn't say no, but we're not aiming for a milestone to become the next huge brand. I don't need milestone to become Siemens or milestone to become Johnson & Johnson. But what I do want is for products that we make and things that come out of our work to go into those pipelines. If I am able to sell, if the products I, that we create out of our processes are sold under the Johnson & Johnson name or, you know, Autobach or Black & Decker or any big name, we're working with those who have the distribution channels ready and have the marketing and have the ability to get things out there. And we are, a lot of times it's, it's ego. Ego, people want to become the next big name and this and that. And we're saying, we're happy to become, to move forward and just get it out there, to make the impact and move it ahead. And we're starting and we're a startup. We hope to get there. I think there's also a matter of, uh, sorry. No, go ahead. I think it's also the, the power of, if you're looking at products today, it's, it's impossible to uh, point on one discipline. 
their product development requires a very big staff of professionals. And what we're trying to do by breaking the silos is bring it into to the room as many professionals as possible. And the moment you have the variety of people trying to tackle a problem together, this is pretty much mimicking what's going to, what's happening in real life. So it's the beginning of a process as well. Yeah, can I just um, comment? I want to reinforce your idea of small scale. I just I accompanied a group of these students, business college students, to Israel last spring, and the theme was startup nation. And we heard a talk from someone from Tom at WeWorks. Oh. Arun was his first name from Idan. 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 Yeah. 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 And that's where I first heard the term need knowers, which just struck me. But I'll tell you, in his talk, what really got me was he explained uh, a solution to a problem that maybe five children have around the world. Mm -hmm. And synchronously, designers work, or people from different disciplines work on this problem that will only affect perhaps these five kids, yeah. one in Indonesia, one in Vietnam, one in Australia. It was mesmerizing because the scale was small, and they were making a difference, but it wasn't, their yeah. intention was to scale up, now we can do it with mm -hmm. five million kids. It was finding those, yeah. a solution for these people. I thought that was just yes. brilliant, but I, I wasn't sure how it was gonna be sustainable. Right, so full disclosure, um, yes. I was one of the founding team members of that organization, of Tom. Um, and it I was stands there. for? Tikkun Olam Makers. Tikkun Olam is repairing the world in Hebrew. I was one of the founding members of, uh, of the team there, and I, literally crossed the globe with them over the course of three years. It was my baby. I built it from, you know, one place in Israel to 35 around the world in three years. Um, they're doing incredible work. I love what they do. The reason why I left uh, about a year ago is because our model wasn't making sense to me anymore. That is where I sort of got into this whole day after syndrome. We had these makeathons. They were incredible. They were amazing. We didn't figure out the day after. We talked a lot of things, we had a lot of big grand plans, and I, the model with Tom was, not to go into that too much, but the model with Tom was have these makeathons, bring in volunteer engineers to work, develop and full prototypes, and then put everything online um, in open source available for anyone in the world to download. And as I really began to sort of push down and drill down into what our plans, I realized, I really, kind of got turned off by the idea of always working with volunteers. I think that bringing in volunteers for a three-day event is amazing and wonderful and coming to mentor, or if you're in as a professional mentor for a course over a semester, that's one thing, but asking professionals to use their skills with you every day, long-term, for free, wasn't sitting with me so well. And I began to have a lot of conversations and put myself in the shoes of a mother of a child with a disability. And you know, any mother knows that if your kids are in bed and fed and bathed and held at the end of the day, you've had a good day. And these mothers don't know what maker spaces are, they don't know what, you know, Thingiverse or online platforms are, they're not gonna go in and download a file and, you know, order, it's, it's the, I, don't, I didn't see how it was gonna work. And one of the things that, we had a lot of talk when we were starting up, are we a business, are we a nonprofit, are we a B Corp, what are we, what is our, you know, technical layout? And we realized that, we have to be some kind of business, an LLC, because product development, in order to get products to users, it has to be, it has to be sold. Now they need to be sold at relevant price points if you are in the United States at a US price point, if you were in Mumbai at a Mumbai price point, you know, making it relevant to the market, but as far as development cycles and the time it takes to make things, nonprofits just aren't built for that kind of model. So Tom was kind of where I, got started in this whole great social innovation world, but it's also why I kind of moved on to the next thing to sort of, you know. But it's a great uh, presentation, sure. So we now have a plan for global domination, <laughs> and um, they're both here to join myself and Vishal under the auspices of the Siebel Center for Design. Yeah. And the long-term goal is to generate the first on-campus assistive technology incubator that focuses on aging and disability and small changes with huge impact, inspired by extreme users, but that will lead to an impact in the wider population, be it product, service, environment, whatever. And so um, they're coming on campus, they're gonna do a makeathon. It's really for students, but I think we can open it up to the wider community, if you wanna send any key people. And it's all about the day after. Yeah. It's about where we take this. And so they come to us with their network, their mentality, 
of, um, I can only describe it as the, the ninja Israelis that get things done. You don't like that? I find it. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and I think, you know, based in New York, based in Tel Aviv, you know, the, the connection you have, I think the stars are aligning. But, I mean, everybody in this room, they're here on a cold day to listen and to be part of a wider family. And I know you haven't seen everything on campus because you've seen one room in the College of Business. You've seen a lot. And a cool bar in downtown Champagne where you have to serve yourself. Um, oh, and we have great Indian food. And res. And res. Res, res. Apart from that, what do you think we should be aware of? Where should Where's the ball? I'm trying to do a sporting analogy. No, well, first of all, <laughs> what should I say? What was that? That was bad. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. What, you know so little about us, and we're going to develop a longer working relationship, and we because we have to work and, and love what we do, which we do. What's next for us? Where, where do you where do you see our potential? And, and where's the ball? Sure. Yes. Yeah, so first of all. Dina Seigig is doing more PR. We love her, she's great. Um, but, I mean, so yesterday, what we're doing on campus is we, I was gonna put pictures in originally, but we ended up doing it virtually because classes were canceled, but we were here working and doing a workshop in Vishal's business class, business school class. I'm not sure what the class's full title is, but we ended up doing it virtually online with the students because they were home because of the weather yesterday. But the whole idea with the class is that they're bringing the students from the in the maker lab together with you know, people who come from, from Dres, people who work, work, at, work with Dres together to kind of solve their opportunities, look at their challenges, and we already started. They met with each other, they worked together, and yesterday our kind of goal in that class was students had, um, we have one of those students actually here with us in the room, but students kind of, you know, talked to the different individuals, the different, we were calling the mentors in the class framework, but they began talking with them, they were, you know, discussing their, their lives, what they do, what they need, what the opportunities are, what the pain points are. And our role yesterday, as part of this sort of beginning of this longer process, was to get them to hone in their, their whole competition into a one-sentence opportunity statement. So we worked with them over the course of three hours yesterday to really come to the point where they have this one opportunity statement. So we're starting in with that, and we're making it sort of really honed in statement. And we help them focus on areas where there's a real need, things that have sort of broader, um, you know, applications for the different mentors. And I'll give you an example of, you know, two of the projects. One of the mentors wears a uh, full leg prosthetic and she does incredible um, distance track running. She's going to go out for the uh, Paralympics in Tokyo. And, you know, she was saying that in, she does a lot of yoga as well. And the prosthetic, she has this really gorgeous, you know, Hundred thousand dollar you know, prosthetic with a knee with AI that can type crazy things, but that the the leg is built for aesthetics and carbon and speed. And she says she does yoga and she has a really hard time kind of balancing on the prosthetic, doing different yoga moves. And so the beginning of the talk was well, how can we create sort of a new base or a new thing to add on to the prosthetic? And because we're in an educational framework, we're also very very clear on you know we're going to add the prosthetic. No one is going to start hacking this hundred thousand dollar leg. We don't want to get, you know, we don't want to break her leg. We don't want to deal with anything to do with her, like voiding the liability or the warranty. So very much about adding on, but looking at that, and there's all kinds of applications there. Or you know, another challenge would be, you know, she slips and slides all over the cold weather. And if you can start with that and move things forward, then you know, the sky's the limit. I want to add that you know, if you look at the overall picture, there's you've got everything here. You have a strong community, you have a fantastic research center, you have amazing university. Just connect the dots. I mean, it's all here. So Yeah, I think the biggest thing is you know, <laughs> breaking, breaking the silos. You know, business and literally we went yesterday to between the business school and the design school now. We drove because it was Arctic. I saw it. You I didn't do it twice. You're braver than most. We drove. I've stayed in the car. But that distance is so short between business and arts and design, and yet the dean didn't know Vishal, Vishal didn't know the dean, and just, you know, how do we create the synergies from us coming in as outsiders are obvious. And for those of you who are, you know, now working in the business world, you're working people all back and all the time. But in university, you know, the resources are there, the money is there, you know, 
it's it's a natural fit, but it doesn't happen. So if we can break down some more silos here um, with Rachel with the Siebel Center of Design, then we're also you know that's a win-win as far as we're concerned. Good question. Yeah, I completely agree with you, and I, I wanted to uh, kind of uh, bring out your point, um, two points actually, um, the multidisciplinary teams and a customer-centered approach was like very, very attractive to me, and I think like that's, that we all must, uh, even like these startups, like, like we are like having different thoughts, like we all want to do something for the society, right? So like, Getting together makes a lot of these kind of discussions like open up our minds to think further, deeper, mm -hmm. um, and customer centered approach is like a very, very attractive thing to me. Like, I completely agree with you. Thank yeah. you. Do things happen kind of here as part of the research park or companies you know, meeting and talking formally, informally? Is there sort of a basis for interaction beyond the just passing people in the hallway? If I'm just not, I'm just curious. There is. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's at the beginning of these kinds of things, yeah. And that's why you sit in a research park as opposed to any other space kind of anywhere. There's a reason why people try to have bring companies together and yeah. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? Excuse me after the class. No worries to get in a coat. Great. I have I have one question. I'm, I'm actually probably asking for somebody else, but um, what's the process that you guys go through if somebody or a group comes to you and it's one of those things where they have an idea, they think it's there, but they can't quite synthesize exactly what it is, but they know it's going to be brilliant. What's the process that you guys go to actually help them come to that point where they say, yes, that's exactly what I'm thinking about? Well, I think it depends who is there, what type of group are you talking about is there? Just entrepreneurs or private entrepreneurs? I'm, I'm thinking about the medical school where they, when they graduate, they have to come up with something. You know, one of the, the things that the game uses is that the stethoscope has been used for over 100 years and nobody reinvented or retransformed or anything like that. So they're tasked with coming up with something that does exactly what you're talking about. But I can see them getting to the point where it's like, ah, I've got this idea, but I don't know exactly what I'm wanting to make. It's, a, it's, a, it's interesting. So we are we are helping for some kind of accelerator and uh, research centers to to come up with uh, with ideas as well. So, um, being in New York, there's a place called E Lab NYC, and uh, mostly dealing with um, bio ventures. And I remember that they have helped um, helped them to to gather their ideas. And uh, somehow we came up to create some kind of um, health and science hackathon for the medical uh, students in the in the area. And it's interesting. One of the one of the groups came with the idea of uh, you mentioned the stethoscope, so I'm thinking about that. Um, everything to do with um, how do you call it? Uh, telemedicine. So she had a session with her doctor. She was holding the, her computer, and the doctor wanted to, to see if she has a strep. She she had to open her mouth and somehow to put the camera of the computer in a way that she could see what's happening in the world. So from there, she started to think, okay, maybe I can attach a kind of a portable camera, and then from here to there, um, she came over, she was one of the teams of the hackathon, and she teamed up with uh, Cornell University, and they wrote several patents on, on her idea, but it was after we scanned and we distilled exactly the idea and how we would like to present it, what exactly would we be trying to achieve what are the benefits of um, investing in something like that. And now she's running for a, a seed uh, funding, and uh, most likely she will, she will get it. So she developed a very interesting uh, kit that comes with uh, your insurance. It's what she's selling for insurance companies, a kit that is a camera that connects to a stethoscope or a pacifier, and all sort of things that you can actually check your child, yourself, for a better picture or visual when you're interacting with a doctor online. Um, so each and every case has its own path of research, but we're not just jump and say, okay, let's just do it. Right. We will definitely go to research to check that there is a potential there. Yeah, and I'll say one thing about the research. Um, check, go through, and really, really make sure that it's not already out there. I was sitting in a session of the, a group out of, also out of the Cornell Medical School that was looking at, you know, helping doctors, helping you know, graduates figure out, you know, do, you know, products and innovation and, you know, startups, and there was horror story after horror story after horror story of people 
putting in time and money and energy, creating in front of them, getting to the point where they have this thing ready to go, and then the next day, patent infringement lawsuits coming in. That's it, you're done, you're dead, funding gone, okay. patented. So I'm saying, yeah, but no, the research, no, 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 I'm saying research and making sure that the things are, you know, is the thing there. And there's all kinds of theories. We do a lot of, you know, kind of design thinking type methodology where we help people hone in on, on the idea. And getting down to a one sentence challenge statement is also crucial. And one of the things that we really focus on, we have time to get into it really, but with our methodology is we say, fall in love with the challenge, not the solution. So a lot of times our minds go right away to, this is the problem. Oh, we come in and put a patch and do that and bring this in and that in. But before we go into thinking what the solution could be, we have to stop and really think about what is the challenge and define the challenge clearly and concisely and as simply as possible in one sentence because from there we can go ahead and develop. And oftentimes when we're doing that, we find ourselves creating a much more simple and concise solution than where our mind was originally gone, which is this crazy sort of big, things, but we want to do simple and concise, and a, a clear and focused challenge often makes the development process much, much easier and much simpler. That would be my sort of biggest one line takeaway. Yeah. I think in general, um, we would, so this is incredible tour for us, and just to see this research center, and uh, we don't know exactly how you guys reach out, or how you create your innovation, what is your methodology, but we'd be very happy to learn more and to interact and maybe to, to try to facilitate in order to maybe to reach out to the community that you have here. Because I think that's the essence of you know cooperation, research, university and community, just to collaborate together. You have the ecosystem here. And you're back in April. We are. We yeah. are. It's gonna be better weather. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. 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 Wait, I I was oh. I was <laughs> <laughs> maybe. You live in a weird place. <laughs> Will there be a minus? That's the temperature. Probably no minus. Potentially, you don't know. Can't, 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 can